This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth, where we're exploring all sorts of business topics. Experts from around the world, join me, your host, Diane Helbig, for a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. Take what you need, when you need it. Featured on Inc.com, Forbes, and MSNBC's Your Business, this podcast is recognized as one of the best podcasts for small business, sales, leadership, social media, and more. When it comes to business, Accelerate Your Business Growth has got it covered. And now on with the show. My guest today is Chris Rodriguez. Chris is a 20-year marketing veteran with a passion for driving growth and tangible results for brands and entrepreneurs. He's worked with over 30 startups across all tiers of funding and sizes, generating brand awareness, web traffic, signups, downloads, and most importantly, customers and revenue. He now runs iXL.co, a B2B SaaS-focused demand generation and marketing operations agency based out of the greater Washington, D.C. area. Thanks so much for being here today, Chris. Thank you for having me, Diane. Excited to chat with you today. I'm excited to chat with you, too. We are recording this um, sort of early 2024, first quarter, 2024. And um, over the past, I would say, couple of years, there's been an awful lot going on with digital marketing. So I am curious, from your standpoint, what you think um, are and will be, at least through this year, the most impactful channels in digital marketing? Sure. So perhaps a little bit of a cop-out answer, but my take is... It's not so much that the channels themselves have changed, but it's more the evolution of the tactics within the channels. Oh. So, for example, uh, I'm a big believer in the concept of uh, account-based marketing from a B2B standpoint. And at the end of the day, that still simplifies down to finding the right target market in the form of a mm. list and placing that list across the various target channels, paid social, paid search, paid display, and cold email for prospecting, and uh, making sure that those efforts are personalized in nature or hyper-segmented such that the right message gets to the right person. Um, That part hasn't changed. What might be changing here is the idea of uh, the, let's say, personalization for cold email or the hyper-segmentation to get um, more efficient ROI from your efforts. I think there you have to pay attention to the legalities at play with, for example, Google mm-hmm. and their recent rule changes for spam email. Um, there are privacy concerns abound over the last year or two about uh, being able to utilize things like cookies. Um, and so... It's just a matter of the tactics changing and following along with the progress of the industry. Interesting. Okay. Well, that makes sense to me when you say it. Is is what about B to C? Sure. So I think in B to C, um, similarly, the idea of the channel isn't changing. Okay. It's more the approach within it. So for example, big believer in paid social targeting based on interest, targeting based on words or hashtags used. Um, I think maybe there is an evolution towards uh, TikTok ads more so than Hmm. in in years past. That isn't so much new for 2024. It's more an extension of 2023. 
um, but still continuing to grow there. I think uh, Facebook ads are becoming, let's say, more difficult to improve your metrics without getting hyper specific and hyper targeted. So an example would be if I'm selling, let's say, a sneaker, I'm a big fan of uh, sneakers, you might want to regionalize your campaigns in order to understand that certain regions perform better than others, certain demographics perform better than others. Again, the the high level isn't so much what changes, it's more the approach in the weeds. And so I'm a firm believer in hyper-segmentation, personalization. I think that those uh, tactics will continue to grow in importance. Okay, I I agree with you. What do you say to the person who says, I don't want to get that specific because I feel like I'm going to miss out on potential buyers? Sure. So whether it's B2B or B2C, Uh I'm a firm believer in funnel management, which is Uh to say, you know, the traditional cliches, you can easily Google them, but awareness, consideration, uh, followed by decision, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. It's the same methodology, which is to say you want to create high level awareness with an expectation that only but a few people will actually care about what you're making them aware of. Think of it as a large fishnet analogy okay. in the ocean. You're picking up fish, but you're also picking up shoes, litter, scraps, seaweed. Right. And so when you shake it out, you end up getting the people who actually uh, matter versus don't. And then you continue to market deeper in that way. So Uh from a top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel perspective, I might do a video ad at the top of funnel and probably about 90 to 95% of those people will not care about my video and will keep scrolling. Total seconds watched on my video, less than three seconds. But for those that watched it for 15 seconds or 30 or 60, I'm deeming those people to show interest. And so you keep further nurturing or um, warming up those people with more marketing in a separate, more hyper-segmented campaign. Call it middle of funnel. You're still browsing, I like to say, consideration. Um, To then finally see, wow, even more engagement from that second level of engagement. Now we take you to a third level of engagement, which is to say, buy now, buy now, retarget, um, very aggressive to the sale. Um, if you were to think about your ratios of focus or budget or efforts, think of it as 20, 20, 60, which is to say, uh, for those that are just being coming aware of us in the first place, I might spend 20% of my budget for those that are still browsing middle of funnel, call it consideration, uh, also 20%. And then finally, for those that have really showed interest, Go aggressive, 60% of your efforts and your budget. Wow, that thank you. And thanks for the example of, of the video. That whole thing that you went through make, made perfect sense to me. It really um, clarified, you know, the hyper-segmentation, what you're talking about. Um, so when you talk about personalization... Can you give the listeners some ideas of like what that looks like? Is it, is it, because I hear it and I think, okay, you're using their name. Sure. It, is is it that, is it that and, or that, or, you know, what, what are some examples of personalization? Sure. So I'll use myself as an example. Okay. Um, at the risk of maybe sharing a bit too much about me, but uh, I, I try to be an open book, right? So obviously there's my name, Chris. There's my location. I'm in the greater Washington, D.C. area. There's my profession. I'm a digital marketer. There's my heritage. Uh, last name Rodriguez. I am of Latino descent. Um, there is my education. I've attended the University of Virginia, uh, also spent a a small amount of time at NYU, and went to a high school in New Jersey called Lawrenceville. 
Um, and so these things may be relevant if I can find them through targeting to then indicate interest. For example, um, NYU alumni group, UVA alumni group, Lawrenceville alumni group, uh, marketers in the greater Washington, D.C. area. So this is at least the very first surface level of personalization. This is about me. This isn't about some product, someone maybe selling random cars or bags. And just because I'm in DC, I care about the car or the bag. Right. Um, I may care about something else. I, I've shown interest. I've clicked like on several pages on Facebook. I'm a big fan of the New York Knicks, uh, New York Yankees, New York Jets. So if you're trying to sell merchandise from the New York Jets, you're going to see that I like that uh, product. Mm. Um, you might also see that I liked it, but I am a marketer. So you might say, uh, marketers in DC want to go to the Jets Redskins game, excuse me, the commanders game. <laughs> um, and so I give these as light examples just to say a Venn diagram overlap of demographic information plus interest information is usually a great start to personalizing something for me. Yes, you can enhance it even further by saying, hi, Chris, right? And that's yeah. a little bit overdone, but yeah. still useful. Um, you might also see my behavior. So a common one is in e-commerce land, I've browsed certain products. I might even have added to cart and simply not checked out. So I'm now being retargeted or the experience is really I'm being chased yeah. across the web with the thing that I almost bought but didn't buy. Um, again, to the sneakers analogy, I am a frequent shopper on a website called StockX. And StockX does a really good job of their retargeting because they take my, my wish list and sometimes my, brow my recently browsed and they follow me through display advertising across my web experience whether I'm visiting ESPN, CNN, Fox, et cetera, I'm seeing this StockX display ad in a dynamic way showing the exact two or three pairs of sneakers that I was just looking at. And if you can, you can relate, I'm sure, as, as well as your listeners, because many different products do a good job of retargeting to mm -hmm. highlight this. Um, so that's maybe a branch on the tree of personalization. It is personal to you. Okay. Other people are not seeing that sneaker or that item as as you are. So there are different ways to to approach this concept of personalization. But I just think very segmented, very specific to you. And if you're thinking this way in your in your efforts, um, you will simply put get a higher ROI. Okay, let's talk about ROI for a minute because as you were talking about that, I was thinking to myself, okay, there's a lot of small business owners listening to this podcast. And they're potentially, some of them are potentially wondering what sort of investment it takes for those sorts of campaigns to be effective and worthwhile. So what, sure. what do you think? Well, um, ROI, which for those that it isn't obvious, stands for return on investment, is literally saying, I've invested X dollars, what did I get for it? And simple math would say if I spent a dollar and I got a dollar and one cent, technically I'm, I guess, profitable in that, in that small uh, example. Uh, usually the standard is you would like to get at least two, but often three X on your spend. I spent a dollar, I got $3 back. So if I'm selling a $15 item and I spent $5, but I got one sale, I am very successful. There's an advertising metric called ROAS, R-O-A-S, return on ad spend, which is ROI, but specific to the ad spend. Okay. And so the way that you would usually, let's say, optimize for ROI, or in this case, ROAS, would be to experiment with many different approaches with an expectation that a significant chunk of them will, for lack of a better term, fail. But if you believe in the methodology, in an emotionless way, I'm trying 15 different targets. I might try uh, moms, I might try dads, I might try 
um, you know, interest in X, interest in Y. But I'm deploying all of them in a almost scientific experiment way. I've got hundred dollars. I've got twenty permutations. I'll spend five on each, right? And you'll start to see those that uh, perform better than others. And just to oversimplify, imagine you literally just turned everything off that wasn't working and kept on only the things that were working. Well, you might see of the 20, 17 failed. And instead of saying glass half empty, 17 failed, mm -hmm. woe is me. Imagine a different perspective. I intentionally was experimenting here to find those three wins and Eureka, I found them. Yeah. And so now you've got three, let's say, uh, ROI, ROAS positive um, experiments amongst the 20. And if you continue with that methodology, you'll discover the diamonds in the rough. And if you keep almost in a cohort-like way, trying another 20, and then trying another 20, suddenly you have three winners in the first, three winners in the second, three winners in the third, and lo and behold, you have nine winners. And that is a sort of experimental methodology for how to find actual ROI positive efforts. The same logic holds for email marketing. Maybe you tried three different copywriting approaches and you A, B test or A, B, C test in that example. And you clearly see copywriting two is better than one and three. So for future, you turn off one and three and ramp up on two. That mentality applies across the board for all channels be it paid or organic or call it free uh, marketing efforts. Yeah, that's great. That That is, yeah, I like that a lot. It, it's all about finding what works. Yeah, and, and I, try to, I try to be, I try to be emotionless about the uh -huh. process. Um, now, of course, do I have a horse in the race here and there? Sure. <laughs> sure. But if you're in a room full of executives it behooves you to say, though I believe X will perform best, uh -huh. here's my informed hypothesis or my experience. I'm also uh, not leading with ego and in an emotionless way. If the data says I'm wrong, so be it, I'm wrong. And we're going to go towards the data that's right. That's generally the methodology that I've used to engender trust uh, sure. amongst um, colleagues and clients. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think there's... I think you have to do it in an emotionless way because you have to be making logical decisions when it comes to the paths that you are implementing to, to get to goal. Um, so it's part of the reason why I really, I appreciate that tactic. Um, when it comes to organic uh, marketing, are there, you had mentioned video earlier, so I'm just curious if you think there are certain tactics that work better than others, or I mean, I'm sure it's a mix, but what are, I'm curious what your your thoughts are on what people can be doing that maybe they're not thinking of. Sure. So when we use the word organic, organic is channel agnostic but it is to oversimplify the free side of that channel whereas let's say social media there's call it organic social and paid social mm -hmm. um, search engines there's organic search and paid search right so if you think about organic as the quote free side of the channel then what we're talking about is there's quite a few limits to what you can do um, organic social, there are certain variables and you can check the box of following best practices, posting with certain types of copywriting that engenders clicks, maybe some emojis, uh, posting at certain times, posting on certain dates. All of that is true, but, um, incremental in certain respects. Um, that said, you should be utilizing the right words publishing at the right times. I'm referencing organic social media um, and testing those things to see what type of copywriting, what day of publishing, what time of day of publishing 
uh, gets more engagement. A lot of this stuff is one Google away. Um, for example, it's known in, let's say, email marketing that certain days of the week and certain times are better than others. Uh, I'll say uh, Tuesdays is better than a Friday or emailing during commute times is better than um, emailing during heads down business hours to some extent. So there's it's important to optimize for those variables just as table stakes. Now, um, to your example of video, let's say organic video, mm -hmm. the first thing to do is certainly create a killer video. And, <laughs> and to that, like, there's only but so much that I or any one of us can say. There's, there's certainly different approaches in terms of uh, certain hooks to use, uh, saying something big and impactful in the first 15 seconds. Yes, again, a lot of this is a Google away. But at the end of the day, the video needs to be good. Now, let's assume you have a good video. Um, I'm a firm believer in SEO, and there is a video version of SEO, YouTube optimization. And so writing the right titles, writing the right descriptions is very important for your video success, so long as you're distributing on YouTube, which I highly recommend. Um, so again, the research of the right words, utilizing those right words, um, placing them in the right locations and with some level of frequency will allow you to appear high on the algorithm in the YouTube example for YouTube search results. And the same logic applies for Google and or Bing uh, as it relates to organic search results there. Keyword research is important. Mm. I'm, I'm a big believer in not under crediting keyword research. There is a particular metric that really matters called keyword difficulty, which is to say difficulty to rank on a scale of zero to 100. So hmm. many, many people say SEO is long-term delayed gratification. I need results now. <laughs> sure, that's true more so than it is false. Yes, but there are ways to accelerate that. And the core way is to understand very low keyword difficulty. In other words, is it as literal as if you write it, they will come? No, but close. Because if your keyword difficulty is five out of 100, you can easier than, than other permutations rank on the first or second page of that term. So that applies to video optimization, that applies to optimizing your own website today, your product pages, that applies to new blog content strategies, low keyword difficulty. If there were one metric for organic uh, visibility, it would be low keyword difficulty. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Great. Uh, this has been so enlightening. I mean, this is the the thing about digital marketing is there's a lot to know. Uh, it changes a lot, <laughs> but a lot of the things that you talked about are um really things that just make good common sense so sure. right thank you for that feedback by the way yeah <laughs> yeah it's great it really it, it is really great chris i i appreciate it um will you tell the listeners how they can find you please absolutely yeah so i am at the website i excel i e x c e l dot co not dot com and I'm also prominent on LinkedIn. My username is Chris Excel. So C H R I S E X C E L. And you'll see a friendly cartoon avatar there uh, will, that will happily accept your friend request and happy to uh, answer any questions or get on any calls or chats. Uh, those are the two best ways to, to reach me. Awesome. So great. I'll make sure they're in the show notes. So again, thank you very much. And listeners, thank you. You are who we're doing this for. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, a production of Evergreen Podcasts. Discover more episodes of this podcast and explore others at evergreenpodcast.com. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. 
And if you're looking to get your sales strategy headed in the right direction, pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. The Jim Stroud Podcast explores the discoveries and trends forming the future of our lives. Brain-to-brain communication, robot bosses, microchip implants for workers, and artificial intelligence replacing human workers are all happening now. If you want to know what's happening next, subscribe now to the Jim Stroud Podcast.